Thank you very much, Andy, and thanks to everybody for um, extraordinarily rich presentations and uh, really substantive um, points to discuss. If I may, what I want to do is uh, highlight a few of the points or takeaways that struck me from reading uh, the books uh, that Rosemary was involved with um, and hopefully move the discussion from there. Um, the first point, perhaps, is to emphasize the importance of the kind of approach that was used um, in, in these books. Uh, obviously, Peru was a single case study, but there is definitely a sense of comparative historical institutionalism, at least in the latter book, um, which really does show very clearly that history matters, which sounds obvious, but um, is often overlooked, and that um, institutional legacies matter. And the, the authors make um, the point often that um, institutions are not, or legacies are not meant to be deterministic as such, but they certainly do define the boundaries of what is politically feasible and realistic and what kinds of policy changes and transformations are possible. And in this discussion of the interaction between conflict and distributional tensions um, and, and how they interact with institutions um, in the formation of states and in the articulation of state society relations, you can see how, how important that is. Another uh, point that comes across very clearly is that um, state society relations and development can be understood as ongoing uh, struggles um, and contestations um, of power, but among different groups. Um, so there's no such thing as a monolithic state and a monolithic society. Um, I think what comes across very clearly here is that you have competing elites and you have competing groups um, outside of, of, uh, of elites that, that really do contest um, for power, and this is the, the constant interaction um, that is ongoing. Another thing um, that struck me is that nowadays it has become uh, quite fashionable, I would say, to discuss development in terms of a collective action problem, and if we can address that collecti collective action problem, we will tackle the problem of development. And I think that that is very true. But again, um, a really important insight that comes out uh, from these books, and especially I think in the case of the Peru book, is that um, we need to understand why collective <coughs> action has been difficult to bring about and to sustain over time. And getting to the, to the heart of that question, we get to the core of issues related to inequalities and power differentials. Um, and that is a really important uh, message that comes across. Um, and this is something also that has come across in the discussion at this table already, that uh, uh, um, horizontal inequalities can be quite durable the persistence of power over time is quite striking, stri striking, and the word that is used in the Peruvian book is that um, inequalities become embedded, and so this really is a, a problem for collective action. And it underscores really the necessity to develop effective mechanisms to channel uh, conflict and grievances in a peaceful manner, um, and again it has become fashionable uh, to discuss the potential for this kind of thing at the local level, which again is really important. But these books, again, and especially the, the Peruvian one, emphasize that it's not enough to be able to do this at the local level, and there have to be uh, bridging institutional mechanisms that transcend from the local to the national level to be able to make a difference uh, that really is sustainable. Um, and, and this point, I think, is very, very important to, to emphasize. And one of the missing links these days, of course, are functional political parties who can do this, uh, because this is really a critical um, mechanism that ought to be linking state and society in more fruitful ways and, and is not happening um, in many contexts. Another message that came across very strongly for me um, is the, the how complex processes of transformation are and how bringing democracy to the mix can actually exacerbate rather than alleviate some of these tensions and problems. Um, the Peruvian case <coughs> is very emblematic of this, but if you look at what's happening uh, with Bolivia, for example, that's also very interesting. And the case of Botswana is, uh, is one where you, you also can see uh, that not all transformations um, um, go hand in hand in mutually reinforcing manners, and there's some tensions <laughs> and trade-offs that are always involved. Now, in terms of the um, topic of this book on, on mineral wealth, um, it is rather striking, um, uh, and the, all of the case studies speak to this uh, very strongly, how uh, much uh, mineral wealth can exacerbate tensions and generate uh, conflict, especially in a context of, of weak institutionalization. And I think this is an extremely important <coughs> thing to keep in mind uh, because, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about how fragile states uh, will be able to transform themselves because a lot of them have 
uh, a wealth of natural resources that they can exploit. Uh, but there tends to be sort of an easy assumption that if only they can exploit this properly, all problems will be solved and all of this wealth will be uh, invested in the country and um, there will be a, a, a sort of a, a virtuous model of inclusive development in place. And I have just been spending some time studying Guinea, for example, where there is an extraordinary reserve of, of, uh, of mineral wealth that, that is uh, about to be exploited. And we have been talking to donors who are involved there. And there really is this very uh, virtuous way of thinking about how once this wealth, uh, th this mineral wealth can be exploited properly, um, there will be resources to invest in the Guinean population. And again, this, this book here is, um, in particular emphasizes that, well, um, historical um, institutionalism matters, the way that institutions have shaped uh, the way that the state uh, is formed and the way that state and society interact matter. And um, there is no easy way of exploiting this wealth. And I think this is a message that the international community has to take much more strongly than it has so far. Um, and just to sort of finish off the, the things that struck me, um, Obviously, these books um, are very much based in the tradition of political economy analysis of understanding tensions, conflicts, interests, what have you. And I think it is also fair to say that the international uh, donor community, um, with some uh, donors in particular being at the for forefront of this, have taken to heart the importance of understanding the political economy con uh, context in which they work. Um, however, I think there's something uh, of a disillusionment sinking in for a lot of the donors because um, many of them are perceiving that political economy analysis may be the, the art of what doesn't work or the art of failure mm -hmm. because they want to see easy ways of taking this forward. And I think what, what comes across from these books is that it is not a simple, straightforward uh, path from understanding to actually acting on, the, on, on what's happening. So really the challenge is if uh, tackling horizontal inequalities is about changing power structures and power dynamics, which that's what it is about, do donors have the necessary room for, for maneuver to do this? Should they be the ones doing this? Um, and will they, I mean, are they positioned in such a way and also do they function internally in such a way that they can actually do something about this without doing further harm? Thank you very much, Helena.